Shake somebody's hand and say, we need to have a little church today, would you? Amen. You may be seated if you've done that. I want to say how much I'm honored to be in the Mississippi District and to be asked to speak at this camp meeting. I am not by nature a camp meeting preacher. This is not my normal venue. This is definitely an anomaly for me. But I am here and I'm going to do my best while I'm here. If you will allow me today, I'm going to change pace again as I did uh, the first day to the second day. And I'm just going to preach extemporaneously today, if that won't be offensive to anyone. Uh, Kind of a Starbucks moment where we just sit down and talk about the Word of the Lord. I love the Bible and I want to bring to you a section of the Bible that is very dear to my heart today. Uh, But I want to just do it just as though we were in a conversational basis and and uh, preach to you about one of my very favorite subjects. Let me tell you uh, just a little personal note here. For many, many years, I read the Bible through every single year. I ordered the little paper from headquarters and has the little check marks, and I marked them off many years, at least 20 years. I read the Bible from cover to cover, and that's certainly a wonderful thing to do. I recommend it. I hope, hope you do that at times in your life, if not every year, certainly frequently. I discovered in my life that just reading it through didn't always make me understand it better. I appreciated the, rep- the, the repetition, and, but, but it was more of a journey or a finish line for me to cross uh, before the end of the year. A number of years ago, about six years ago, I stopped and said, I love the Bible, I'm reading the Bible, but I'm not always comprehending it. And I don't know that I comprehend it now, but I'm attempting to. So I stopped that year and did not read it from cover to cover, but I spent that year on the Gospel of John. It so impacted my life that I spent, uh, when I finished that year in the Gospel of John, I spent a year and a half on the Gospel of Matthew. And then when I finished Matthew, I tried to do Luke. Luke's been very difficult for me. He's a, he's a different cut. He's a Gentile, a doctor, educated, a lot of different facets. The way his book is constructed, spent two and a half years on that. And I'm currently in the book of Mark. Haven't finished it yet, but um, saved the shortest for last, and it hadn't helped. I'm still going very slowly. So today, you can go ahead and put the word on the screen. All I'm going to do today is talk to you about the Gospel of John. But I'm going to talk to you out of my heart uh, on three phases of this and just tell you how I feel. I want to stop and say thank you, Brother Cooley, for your words today and that generational curse and the work of iniquity. I believe it's the silent killer of Pentecost. I believe that. I believe it is the ninja of the night with its poisoned surakin that takes our people out. And the sooner we can discover what it's all about, the better off we will be. So for all you purists, for all you traditionalists that are not comfortable with this uh, speaking uh, just extemporaneously and not having structure and notes. And uh, I'll go ahead and read a text, okay? So if you want to turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 14, this is for all of you that uh, need this. I wish the flies would leave me alone. Hallelujah. Uh, John, chapter 14, I'm sure you're familiar with it. It says this. John said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So when you boil all this down, it's going to be like a couple of years ago when I preached to you on the Gospel of Matthew. My subject was when a good Jewish son takes over the family business. But the truth is, it was just a one God, Jesus name message. That's what it was. So when you get past all the everything else I say today, I'm going to preach to you on one of the cardinal doctrines of our faith. And that is simply that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Can you say that with me? Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And if we ever relax from that vigilant position every day of our lives that Jesus is coming, we open ourselves to the vulnerability of attack of iniquity and other things. So I want to be vigilant and say Jesus is coming, and I want to live my life on point knowing that he can. First of all, let me introduce you to my favorite 
Bible character. We all have our favorites, and my favorite Bible character, you can put his name on the screen any time. There you are. His name is John. John is quite a guy. John is, uh, first of all, he's Jesus' cousin. John's mother and Jesus' mother were sisters. So he is not only the first cousin to Jesus, but for three and one half years, he is his best friend. He is one of the twelve apostles. When Jesus calls the twelve in Matthew 10 and in other gospels at various places, he selects them and he always puts them in a particular order. Every time you read them in the scripture, the groupings will be the same. They are grouped in groups of four by all of the gospel writers. The reasons are unknown to us, but you'll always have in the first group, you'll have uh uh, Peter, and you'll have Andrew and James and John, those four. In the next group, you'll have Matthew and Bartholomew and Thaddeus and Thomas. That's in my mind. And then you'll have, of course, James, the son of Alphaeus, Judas Iscariot, and you'll have Philip, and you'll have Simon the, the Zealot. And so you're going to have these 12 men. And of these 12 men that Jesus chose, only John, has already been mentioned, lived to a full life. The others are considered historically to die as martyrs. So John, I'm going to use, if, if, if he won't be offended at me today, I'm going to use Brother Clipper as my visual for John. John lived a long time. Stand up, Elder, for just a moment. How old are you? He's 88, but he's had two extra birthdays, so he said he's 90 years old. Hallelujah. And... Uh, the day he was born was a birthday, and it turned around and face this crowd. And the day he was born was a birthday, and then the day he got the Holy Ghost. So he's 88 and got two extra birthdays involved in there. Hallelujah. But if you can picture someone in the congregation today that's lived a long time and been very faithful and elderly, you can see the end of the life of John. Thank you. John lived to be somewhere in his 90s. His final days were spent at Ephesus, the church that Paul established on his third missionary journey and his five-year stay there. And so you got... You've got John the Elder. In his final days of life, they literally carried him on a stretcher to church every day. And he lifted that frail hand and said, love one another. And that was, that was his message. He is known as the Apostle of love. Simon Peter is known as the apostle with the shoe-shaped mouth because he is constantly sticking his foot in his mouth. But John is known as the apostle of love because he mentions it so much. If you tabulate Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I think you actually add them up if my addition is correct. Uh, they mention the word love some 252 times among the three of them. If you add all of John's up, you take the Gospel of John. 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation, he mentions it, I believe, 247 times. And so John is as active and proactive concerning the love that Jesus talked about as all the other gospel writers put together. Now, I am infatuated with these gospel writers. I apologize today if this is not your cup of tea. That is not tongue-in-cheek. That is sincere. If you are not interested in the men, if you're only interested in checking off the box of your daily Bible reading while you eat your Cheerios, this message won't be for you. Right outside this door and to the left, Brother Dixon has a table of Bible puzzles. I'll buy the puzzle if you want to work it while I preach, if you're not interested in what I have to say. Hallelujah. But I am infatuated with these men. It is amazing to me that in history, 200 people picked up a writing instrument and an implement to write on and recorded the life of Jesus. Historically, we know there are 200 Gospels that were written. Out of those 200 Gospels historically written about Jesus, only four were selected, not only by the correlators of the Bible, but by God Himself to say, I want to tell my life story. They are as diverse and different as you can possibly imagine. It is incredible to me the way that Jesus approaches his whole schematic of things. He says, I'm only going to take four. I'm going to let Matthew write one. He's going to write to the Jewish people. I'm going to let Mark write one. He's going to write to the Romans. He will be first. He will write fast because Nero is killing them right and left. The church is in trouble. They need somebody to write it down. And so Mark writes. He's very brief. He's very fast. He only has about 
660 verses. He is quick. He is uh, 42 times. He uses an adverb or a hurry up form of the verb. Immediately. He has three miracles in his very first chapter. Matthew doesn't write like that. Luke doesn't write like that. They don't have any miracles till the third chapter. But Mark is a different cut. Luke is a different cut. I've already mentioned to you once. He's the only Gentile writer in your Bible. And to the one outsider, the one that was not of the Abrahamic line, God gives him the privilege of, of composing 25 percent of the New Testament. When you figure out the total amount in the New Testament, Luke is the writer of that. He is a magnificent writer. Archaeologists hate him because they want so bad to discredit the Bible. I worked on an archaeological dig in 1994. I know their opinion of the Bible. I sat in their lectures. I got their college credits. And I'm telling you, they want to find fault with the Bible. They would love to find one wrong name. They would love to find one wrong date. But Luke gets all 50 plus names, dates, and titles correct. He's an amazing writer. When he introduces John the Baptist, the man that shatters 400 years of silence from on high, the day that heaven celebrate that God is finally on speaking terms with humanity again, when John steps out of the wilderness and shatters that glass wall of silence, Luke documents it with seven names. He lets you know there's an emperor, there's a governor of this province, and he gives you seven names surrounding John so nobody can point back and say he didn't have it just right. These men were inspired by the Holy Ghost. To me and me alone I say this, but their works, their books are far more fabulous than just some little material that I read while I eat my my morning breakfast. I'm telling you they are worthy of consideration. They are worthy of looking at them and saying they tell me the life of Christ. Do you understand the vast majority of what you know about Jesus are in the hands of these four men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? There were other writers, Pliny the Younger wrote, Josephus wrote, others around the turn of the century. But the vast majority of what we know of Jesus comes from the hands of four men. 196 others are brushed aside as though they did not have the correct man. Matthew is written to the Jew, as you know. So when you read his genealogy, he reaches back. To Abraham, because that's what they're. He, he quotes the Bible more than any other of them. I think he quotes it like 129 times. He reaches back and says, thus it was fulfilled. Because he's writing to people that need the Word of God. Mark, he's writing to the Romans, and they couldn't care less. They've never been to Sunday school. They ain't never been to church. They're a bunch of heathens. So guess how many times Mark quotes the old Bible? One time, hallelujah. He's not interested in quoting the Bible because they're not going to care anyway. And then you got Luke and his particular. They're all different. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Luke is a doctor. He is an educated man. He gives you the viewpoint of the doctor. He has 18 parables that are not found anywhere else in the Bible. He is the one that gives us the parable of the Good Samaritan. That we were informed at Michael Jackson's service yesterday that he was that Good Samaritan. That's what I read in the paper. Anyway, he gives us the parable of the Good Samaritan. He gives us uh, uh, parables that we don't find anywhere else. I like to compare them. You understand? Matthew talks to you about money. He's a tax collector. That's what he does. So he's going to tell you about money. He's going to tell you a little story about, hey, Jesus, our taxes are due. So God says, well, go catch a fish. There'll be a coin in his money. Go pay our taxes. That's in Matthew. But when you read Luke, he read about all kinds of stuff, about physical stuff. He says, there was a man laid at the gate full of sores. Because he's a doctor. So he tells you his physical condition. Matthew would have said, he's broke, he's busted, he's disgusted, he's got no money, and he's behind on his taxes. So you can't divorce the man from the message. And that's what's so incredible. When you set them up there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you take the moment to look at them as a man and their life and what they were and who they were. Now, we know that Luke was probably sponsored by Theophilus, who he writes his book to that in the book of Acts. This was a common practice historically. That's how men like Voltaire and Rousseau, that's how they were supported. A wealthy patron would support a man to do a historical search to authenticate the life of someone that they believed in so that it wouldn't be lost for antiquity. And so Luke was writing at the bequest and probably the support of the man by the name of Theophilus. And then these men wrote the life of Jesus. 
Picture with me now. Mark has been written first. He was written about 50 A.D. He is the timeline that the other two write off of. Matthew actually takes 96% of the book of Mark and puts it in his book. He adds others to it, but he takes virtually all of what Mark had to say, and then he builds on that. On the other hand, Luke doesn't take as much, but he takes a lot. Somewhere around 53% of the book he takes, and he writes his gospel. But Matthew and Luke are born off the timeline of the the Gospel of Mark. And these are magnificent books and we read them and sometimes we see similarities and, and we call them the synoptic Gospels because you can read the same event in them. And then everything is finished, they thought. The books are written. Paul does his missionary journeys. His first from 46 to 48. His second from 49 to 52. His third missionary journey from 53 to 57. He mentions the 13 cities, 16 cities, 19 cities on his journey. And he does his work. He jettisons his gen- his Hebrew name, becomes a Gentile, establishes churches in, in the four provinces of Galatia, Macedonia, Asia, and Acacia. And in four years, he does a magnificent work. And in ten years, people, in ten years, the Apostle Paul establishes churches in every major region. All of that is history now. We're down to the point that the church is moving on. The church is established. Nero has had his persecutions. And there's an aged old man by the name of John. And he's watching all of this. And he's fighting for the things of the church. They are coming against the church with all kinds of false doctrine. One of them was Gnosticism. Those Greeks said, let me just tell you, it's been a long time and Jesus didn't really live. He was a phantom. He was just an imaginatory thing. He was a a man that his followers projected divinity on. But that's when John said, wait a minute, somebody needs to write some stuff down here. There's some things that Matthew didn't have to deal with and Mark didn't have to deal with and Luke didn't have to deal with so I'm going to pick up my pen and the old preacher rose up and he picked up his pen and he said let me tell you guys something read the first verse of First John he said that which we have seen that which we have heard that which we have handled with our hand the word of life John said you might not believe in it but I was there I saw it I'm his cousin I was his best friend Jesus did exist. So there was a need for one more gospel. Thirty to forty years later, they needed a gospel. Not to the Jew, not to the Romans, not to the Greek world, but they needed a gospel to the church. And the reason that we love John so much is this the gospel that are written was written to us. Now, there's several things I like about John. One thing I like about John is he explains things. I like that. I like it when he tells me why he tells me what he tells me. Hallelujah. Did you get that? (laughs) For instance, there's only one miracle common to all four Gospels, and that's the feeding of 5,000. John normally doesn't repeat what the others did, but he did. But when he gave us, And I'll get to this in just a moment as I kind of track you through the chapters. But when we get to chapter 6, just remember, he repeats the feeding of the 5,000. Now, Matthew told you that in chapter 14. Then he told you he fed 4,000 in chapter 15. Mark tells you that. Luke tells you that. But only John stops and tells you why he's telling you about feeding the 5,000. He said, because Jesus is the bread of life. Matthew didn't tell me that. You see that? Mark didn't tell me that. Luke didn't tell me that. And being as, 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 as simple as I am in life, if I, if I have to deal with that on my own, I might not catch that point. But John said, wait a minute, let me give this to you. Not only did he feed the 5,000, but this is why he fed the 5,000. Because he wanted them to know that he is the bread of life. And John tags on what the others didn't bother telling us about the little part where he said, except you eat my bread. My flesh and drink my blood. You have no part with me. And he tells us that that was so offensive to them that they turned by the thousands and walked away. And the hemorrhage was so powerful that he turns to the twelve and he says, Will you go also? And Simon Peter says, Where would we go? Thou hast the words of life. We would have never known that without John. Don't tell me that John's gospel wasn't necessary. It is a powerful book in the Bible. We would be impoverished without the gospel of John. I told you, Matthew, he reaches back to Abraham 
because he's writing to Jews. He wants to authenticate his book. So in his genealogy, he reaches all the way back 1900 B.C. to Abraham. Well, Luke, Mark, he don't have time for that. He just passes it on by. Hickam and Shai pass it on by. They weren't concerned about that. They were rolling people in wax and burning them in Nero's garden. They were celebrating them being fed to the lions. He didn't have time to talk about who's whose father. He had to get on with the program here and get a gospel out. So Mark hurries up and blows past it. Luke is written to the Greeks or the Gentile world. He's a champion of the Gentiles, incidentally. Champion of women, downcast people. That's Luke's gospel. And so because he's writing to Gentiles, he reaches on past. Abraham and goes all the way to Adam. When you read his genealogy, he starts at Adam. But John said, I'm not reaching to the Jew. I'm not reaching to the Greek. I'm reaching to the church. And so to the church, he's going to write. And you've got to admit what a magnificent moment it is. When he picks up his pen and begins under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In the beginning. Hallelujah. Before there was the brush of an angel's wing. Before a single shard of broken light cast its way through the darkness. When there was nothing but God and his intent and his thought. In the beginning was the word, the thought, the intent, the grand panorama of everything that was going to happen. Sitting in the heavens without a single thing around him, God alone by himself said, in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was the thought, in the beginning was the intent, and the word was God. Hallelujah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word, what what a way to start a gospel, huh? What a way to convince a world that Jesus was God. Luke spent his entire gospel proving that Jesus was the Son of Man. John will spend his entire gospel preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. Hallelujah. The Word, shaft of light goes out. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Same came for witness to bear witness of that light. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, meaning Jesus. And the world was made by Him. And the world knew Him not. Do you understand you're in the New Testament church? The winds of doctrine are swirling around you. You've read Matthew's gospel. You've read Mark's gospel. You've read Luke's gospel. You've read all the epistles of Paul. All the books of the New Testament are now written except this one to the church. And it now falls in your hand on the first day of the week as you come together to celebrate the the, the Lord's Day. And all of a sudden, He doesn't open it like Matthew and them. And all of a sudden, can you imagine the rejoicing in the heart of the church that said He saw Him? He was was his cousin. He was his inner circle. He knew him. He was his best friend. And he says he was in the world. And the world was made by him. And the world knew him not. He came into his own. And his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave me power to become the sons of God. Woo, even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of flesh, nor the will of man, nor the... but of God. And the Word... The thoughts, the intent, the eternal purpose was made flesh. And down at their first century Starbucks, they're hearing the scuttlebutt that Christ never lived. Well, let me tell you what one of the eyewitnesses just gave us this week. Hallelujah. This is hot off the press. Oh, yeah, he lived. He was God manifest in the flesh. Justified in the Spirit. Seen of angels. Priest unto the Gentiles. John is cool in my book because he is so, to use Brother Mooney's word, irrational. I've told you this before, but let me say it again. He writes his book like he is sitting under a shade tree with his feet propped up, just enjoying life. No hurry. You can't read Mark's Gospel without realizing how big a hurry the guy's in. I hurry up when I read it. I have to tell myself, slow down, boy. He's a gunslinger. I mean, John, he's on it. And the reason is, of course, Simon dictated it. Simon Peter dictated it in Aramaic. Mark 
translated it into Greek so they could read it. If you don't believe that, go read the early Testament of the Fathers. But anyway, so you know how Simon Peter was. He was impetuous, always in a hurry. But John's the exact opposite. It's like he just relaxed. He's got his arms crossed. In fact, he only selects 20 little stories out of the life of Jesus to give us one of the most masterful pieces in the history of the world. Greek scholars say, I'm not going to look over here because there's some very smart men over there. I'm going to look over here. There may be some. I'll look up. How's that? Greek scholars say the first 14 verses that I just alluded to in John chapter 1 is the finest piece of Greek literature in the history of the world. Men like Philo wrote 14 volumes on the Logos and never captured the essence like John the fisherman did under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. But the Spirit of God moved on him and said, we need a book for the church. And those first 14 verses of John stand unparalleled, unchallenged, sublime and supreme as the highest piece of Greek literature in the history of the world. Written by a 90-something year old man with no education except how to catch fish. And wasn't real good at that. Jesus had to say, put them on the other side, boy. There ain't no fish. I said, oh, well, okay. John. Chapter number two. Let's go to our text. I'll just walk you through it here for the next few moments. And if you're bored, go get your puzzle, all right? Chapter number two. He turns the water into wine. And I'm going to refer to you as John today, Elder, okay? So, John, you were there. You were in the crowd when the frantic pace said, we're out of wine. What are we going to do? And Jesus said, go get some pots. And they brought them. You were there. You saw it. You were just as shocked as the rest of them as you watched this event take place. And Jesus turns the water into wine. How magnificent is that in chapter number two? Chapter number three. Let me tell you about chapter number three. It's so incredibly awesome. Can you imagine if John had not written... Isn't this something that Matthew, Mark, and Luke never mentioned Nicodemus? How important is John chapter 3? There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. This is no homeless guy. This is no, pardon the, I'm not trying to put it down. This is no blind Bartimaeus by the side of the road, folks. This is, according to rabbinical tradition, the third richest man in Jerusalem. Nicodemus is not a nobody. He is a somebody. He is a member of the Sanhedrin. He is well respected. So by night, you see his furative movements trying to find Christ. And he comes by night. Jesus cuts him no slack at all. He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Whoo! Nicodemus is like, okay, okay, uh, okay. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. I ask you today, how many times have you used that on your outreach? How many times at work? How many times when talking to somebody? about that? How important is the story of Nicodemus? And yet we would not have it if it wasn't for the gospel of John. It's incredible. The very thought of our Bible without the story of Nicodemus is scary. Chapter 4. Show how this fisherman, such in contrast to people and Jesus' methodology of reaching people. In chapter 3, you have a man. In chapter 4, you have a woman. Jesus said, I must needs pass through Samaria. Boys, go to Subway and get us three foot longs. We're going to split it up. And the, he has to kick them out because they don't have any concept of what he's fixing to do. And he meets a woman at the well. Can I just hold up for your consideration the contrast between these two? In chapter 3, it's a man. In chapter 4, it's 
a woman. In chapter 3, he is religious. In chapter 4, she is a heathen. In chapter 3, he is rich. In chapter 4, she is poor. In chapter 3, he knows the law. He knows all about it. But he's afraid. And he comes at midnight. And in chapter 4, Jesus meets her at high noon. Do you see the contrast? Look at how John was able to say, look how Jesus meets every person on their own territory. To Nicodemus, he deals with it head on. You know too much to beat around the bush. But with the woman, he takes his time. With the woman, he's slow and easy. But before he's done, he lets her know. I like the little story because, you know, Jesus can get in your business. <laughs> A guy can be preaching and not even know he's talking to you. And the Holy Ghost be down in there getting in your business. He asked her about her husband. <laughs> well, I don't have a husband. He said, that's right. You've had five. And the one you got now is not yours. You know, you could just see the look on her face. Oh, my. Can I submit to you that John's hidden meaning is that Jesus was the seventh man in her life. That all the things you've been looking for and those relationships, all the inner meaning that you've been looking for, lady, he's right here standing in front of you. This is what you're really looking for. It's not those illicit affairs that are going to bring you the peace and the contentment that you're looking for. But he that speaketh with you is the Messiah. He is all in all. He'll supply. He is my need supplier today. I don't have time to go down that trail. But I'm just going to tell you, look at the contrast of how beautiful. John presents his gospel of a man and a woman and how Jesus deals with them. John is also one of my favorite people because he builds his book around food. And if you're a Pentecostal and you haven't gained weight since you got saved, you probably didn't get the Holy Ghost. Now, baby, we don't eat and we don't smoke and we don't do dope, but we do eat. John's book is built around the seven feasts. It's in there. You know what they're doing in the last chapter? They're having a little barbecue down on the beach. <laughs> Barbecuing some fish. And Jesus said, here, hey, eat this. How many fish we got? Oh, we got 150. He said, here, have some. Have. They eat all the way through the book. He went right into the church. <laughs> we can't do nothing without pie and ice cream in the fellowship hall. You understand that? Matthew's narrative discourse. That's the structure of his book. Matthew's brilliant. It's narrative discourse. Five times in his book he says, and when he had ended these things. So that's his structure of his book. But John, food, baby. Let's eat. And so he takes you to feast. Then he tells the morning, take you to another feast. And it's all about the feast. So in chapter 5, we find him going to Jerusalem for one of the feasts. I will take a little of that water if you got it. We find him going to the feast. And this is uh, the pool of Bethesda. He goes to the pool of Bethesda. And he asks that guy, Wilt thou be made whole? I have to be real careful here because I don't want to be anything less than respectful to God. But that does seem like kind of a dumb question, doesn't it? Or am I the only one that thinks that's dumb? You've been laying there 38 years waiting for the moving of the water, hoping that the, you'll get there before Joe Blow over here that elbows you out every time you get in, and, 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 and the man asks you, do you want to be made well? Hello, what do you think I'm doing here? <laughs> Jesus said, well, get up, take up your bed, and he does, and they get mad. You know why they're mad? Because it's the Sabbath. I'm going to tell you something. Three times in your Bible, Jesus confronts them head on like two trains colliding at a hundred miles an hour on the Sabbath. One of them was when his disciples went through the fields and they ate the corn without washing their hands. They went ballistic. 
How could anybody do that and be sent from heaven? And Jesus hits him head on with it. The second time was when he came down through Perea on his final journey to Jerusalem. He stayed away from Herod's camp that I preached to you about on Monday. Because Herod had the ability and the motive to stop him from going. So he circumvents it, gets over in Perea, and spends at least two months by my calculation. And during that two-month journey, there is a woman bent over in the temple for 18 long years. And Jesus heals her on the Sabbath. Second confidence. This is the third. The three times in the scripture that you can find Jesus confronting them on the Sabbath. And this is the man by the pool of Bethesda. Chapter number six. What I mentioned to you all ago. Feeding of the five thousand. Jesus is the bread of life. Chapter number seven. One of the most beautiful moments in Jesus' life. Jesus knows they're not getting who he is. And in chapter 7, verse number 37, it says, In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. Go look the word up. I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm not a Greek scholar. I'm not a scholar on anything. But I can, all I do is look them up in strong concordance just like you do. But the word means to scream, to yell. Jesus is standing there watching them on the eighth day of their feast in their white robes with their big jars and they're dancing down to the pool of Siloam and filling those jars full of water and coming back singing Isaiah chapter 12 as was their custom with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation and Jesus is watching this and something inside of him turned over because they were rejoicing over water that couldn't satisfy and Jesus cried and said if any man thirst let him come unto me and drink He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Thus spake he of the Spirit which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Chapter 8. You may be seated. Chapter 8. Uncomfortable moment for all of us. They bring a woman to Jesus, taken in adultery. They've got him. The Pharisees are his enemies. They hate him. His first year of popularity, they didn't know what to do with him. He was too hot to handle. The second year, they made up their mind. They they got in collusion, and they said, we're going to get him. And so Jesus, in defense of that, on the opening day of his second year of ministry, according to what I can figure out, Jesus begins to preach in parables so that he can preach so his followers will understand, but those Pharisees will not understand. He clearly tells them that. He says, I'm speaking to you in parables so that you will understand, but they will not because these Pharisees were against him. They were the, they were the keepers of the law, but they didn't have the power. They weren't the political machine. The Sadducees were the political machine. They were the dudes with the money. And let me just tell you this. When Jesus offended the Pharisees for three years, they argued, they faced him, they fussed with him, but they couldn't do nothing. When Jesus offended the Sadducees, within hours he is arrested and on his way to the cross. It was the raising of Lazarus that preempted The Sadducees to say, we're not having that around here. We don't believe in the resurrection. So, chapter number 8, the Pharisees are against him. They hate him. They think they've got him boxed. It's so fun to watch Jesus. Every time they think they've got him, he's so brilliant. Read it in Matthew chapter 21 and 2, when he comes into Jerusalem in the final week of his life. On the final week of his life, he comes in on Friday night, spends the night with Simon the leper. Saturday, he spends it with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. That night, she washes his feet. Uh, Sunday morning, uh, he, he does his triumphal entry. Monday, he curses the fig tree. Tuesday is this little event right here. He comes, and the Herodians come to him, and they say, we're going to get you. Who's? Shall we pay taxes or not? And Jesus said, give me a coin. And the coin. He says, whose inscription? He said, Caesar. So Jesus is so brilliant. He said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. And God, he leaves Caesar on the throne, God on the throne, and them scratching their heads. They go their way. And the Sadducees come and say, well, we're, we're smarter than you bunch of idiots. We'll get him. And so they confront him and say, well, this old boy, he's married to her and then his brother had her. I mean, can you imagine what a, you talk about a redneck family. Hallelujah. And then third brother had her, fourth brother had her, fifth brother <laughs> All seven had her to wife. How would you like to have been brother number seven? Hallelujah. No wonder they didn't have no kids. Huh? Whose wife will she be in the resurrection? They thought they had him again. You know what Jesus said? He said, you do here and not understand the resurrection. And the Bible says the Sadducees, he put them to silence. That's the word the Bible uses. And so the Pharisees had a champion. 
We got him. They had a champion. They had a prodigy. A lawyer. They sent him to Jesus. And with confidence, they said, which is the first and greatest commandment? Once again, Jesus tattoos them good. They're trying to figure out how he's going to answer this. Which is the great commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any of any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath. Honor your father and your mother. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not. And they're saying, and Jesus brilliantly shuts him up. He says the first commandment, and he takes those ten, the Decalogue that they had lived by, and realizes that the first four have to do with God himself, and says the first and greatest commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then he takes the second seven that have to do with our relationships with mankind, and he says, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the Bible says, after that, they durst ask him no more questions. He shut them up once and for all. But we're not there yet in chapter 8 of John because they've got a woman. You know the story. Jesus bends down and writes in the sand. Only the second time in the Bible he ever wrote, he wrote on the Mount of Sinai. He says to the woman, where are thine accusers? I have none. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Chapter 9, another sign. He uses seven signs in his book. Another sign. He heals a blind man, spits on the ground, puts it in his eyes. And they're like, what's this all about? John tells us. You don't have to worry. You don't need commentaries. John will explain it. He said, because Jesus is the light of the world. John chapter 10, I am the door. I am the good shepherd. John chapter 11, the raising of Lazarus that I told you about a while ago. The miracle that catapulted him to Calvary. That the Sadducees said, that's it. We're not taking any more. Get him. Whatever you got to do. Judas, how much do you want? 30 pieces. That's fine. He didn't get the 10% of the 300 pence that could have been spent when the woman broke the, the alabaster box. He stood there and calculated in his mind. Judas did and said that. He's the only Judean in the group. All the others were Galileans. They were country boy, but he was a city boy. And he said, hmm, we could have sold that for 300 pieces of silver. I would have got 30 pieces in my bag. I didn't get it and I'm bitter about that so I'm going to the priest and they bargained for 30 pieces of silver. Chapter number 11 the Sadducees say alright get him. Chapter number 12 the triumphal entry one of the great moments of the Bible. I'm not going to deal with it here for time's sake. Chapter number 13 an upper room a table a towel and a traitor. Jesus says, what you do, do quickly. He leaves. Jesus kneels in front of the other eleven. Washes. We have that scene. John, the man that wrote the book, gives us an insight into that moment. Because in John thirteen thirty five, Jesus looks at those men on whom he's going to place the entire future of everything he's ever come to do. And says, a new commandment give I thee. That you love one another. Isn't it something that Matthew was sitting there and he never caught it? At least if he did, he didn't deem it important enough to put it in his gospel. Isn't it something that Simon Peter, sitting at his elbow, heard it, but didn't think it was important enough to tell Mark to put in his gospel? Isn't it something that Luke, for all of his work, and he was very methodical and thorough. He researched Mary, her song, Simon and Anna at the temple, all the things of his book. But it wasn't included in what he had to say. But John got it. And John said, if he wants me to love my brother, I'm fixing to change who I am. And the one that Jesus called the son of thunder. The Boadjernese, the Chaldean words that means troublemaker, hot-tempered. And he was all of those. He's the one that said, hey, I want to be... Mom, go ask him. You're his aunt. Go ask him. Can I sit on his right and my brother on his left? He is the one that came back and said, Jesus, we found some old boys over there. They're casting out devils and they don't, they don't, they're not our group. And we, you know what we told him? We said, knock it off, dude. That's John. Hot-tempered. Competitive. That is the man sitting at that table 
watching his first cousin and his best friend and his Lord wash his feet and then rise from that moment and say, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And John said, if that's what he wants, that's what I'm fixing to become. I want to tell you that if we ever got that kind of desire, if we ever got past the self-will, if we ever got past the iniquity of self and said, what do you want us to become? Can you imagine the impact we would have on our world if we, like John said, if that's what he wants me to be, I will work to get rid of my human tendencies. I will work to get rid of my whatever my DNA causes this mess or my family background or my generational curses or whatever it is. Can you imagine what would happen if the church ever rose up like John and said, then I will become the apostle of love. He will never never have to tell me twice. He will never have to mention it to me again. I will be what he told me to be. You know the story as well as I do. Come to the music, please. I close with this. I've given you the man. I'm sorry. The man. Put that up there, John. The man. Who he was. And I gave you John the manuscript. His book. And for the last four or five minutes here, let me give you his message. John lived at the end of an age. Jerusalem had been destroyed by the conquering armies. The date was somewhere around 96 A.D. Jerusalem had been gone for some 20 to 25 years. It was now the church adrift on the sea of the Roman Empire. John's in Ephesus, has already finished his banishment, his final years. He's writing a gospel for the church. He realizes that in addition to all the other stuff they have to deal with, the one thing the church needs to reach out and get a hold of is the promise that Jesus is coming back. And so he locks in again on something that Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention. And says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come again. That's not just important for us. It was important for the New Testament church as well. In Acts chapter 16, on Paul's second missionary journey, he went to a place called Philippi. And a Burgeoning revival was cut short by his arrest, thrown into prison with Silas. There's the jailbreak, Paul and Silas out of jail. They asked him to leave because they beat him. And as a Roman citizen, they couldn't do that. The officials were afraid, said, would you just please leave town? And Paul does. He goes down the road to a place called Thessalonica. And again, a promising revival is squelched by the opposition of the Jewish people. They ask him to leave town, the brethren do. By my estimate, judge you for what you were, he was only in Thessalonica for about two months. Then he goes on down the road to Berea, where they say, that's the famous scripture, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind and search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. Those same guys followed him down there, and they ask him to leave again, and he goes to Athens. Confronts the intelligentsia, Mars Hill, that whole thing. Nobody asked him to leave Athens. He leaves himself. Three times in the book of Second Corinthians, he tells us how low he was when he left Athens. When he left Athens and headed for Corinth, he was a beaten man. 
the world's greatest missionary, was at his lowest moment. When he walked into Corinth, the second largest city of the Roman Empire, 700,000 strong, a blue-collar town, only 100 years old, Corinthian architecture, beautiful place. When he walked in there, he said, I've tried everything I can at Thessalonica. I tried it at Philippi. I tried it at Berea. I tried it at Athens, and it's not working. And so he said, I determined that I would preach nothing. Say, Jesus Christ. And him crucified. That's all I'm going to preach at Corinth. And in 18 months built the largest church in the history of the world. And while he's there, he gets a little letter from that little home missions work that he started back in Thessalonica. They said, is Jesus coming? There was a question even then about the coming of the Lord. And Paul picks up his pen and writes him an epistle, the first one he wrote. And said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord. For we shall not all sleep. (laughs) I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord. I like that little phrase in there where he says, For the Lord himself set a sin from heaven with a shout. (laughs) He said, I'm not going to send Michael. I'm not going to send Gabriel. I'm not going to send an archangel. I'm not going to send any of the... the, the, the. No, no, no. He said, when it gets time, he's going to call for that charging white stallion. And Jesus is going to get up off of his throne and sling his long, lean Galilean leg over the back of that horse. And the Bible says that the armies of heaven are going to ride down. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Do you understand that as as important as it was to Thessalonica to know that Jesus is coming? Hold on, baby. It ain't over yet. No matter how bad it gets. No matter how bad Nero is. Or Diocletian. Or any of the other. Hold on, because Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. That we we need to know that in 2009, just as bad as they did in AD 67 or AD 65, we need to remember Jesus is coming. Would you stand with me? John wrote a gospel to the church. Two thirds. Of his book is about the last week of the life of Christ. One third of his entire gospel is about the last 24 hours that Jesus lived. But I'm submitting for your consideration today that the man and the manuscript were designed to point to the message that I will come again. Hallelujah. And I'm coming back to take you home with me. And in my Father's house are going to be many mansions. But in the midst of your hardship, in the midst of your trial, in the heat of the battle, whatever you do, don't forget that John wanted you to know, I will come again. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. We shall not all sleep. But we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Does that still thrill your heart? Is there still a little joy that kicks in down somewhere when you realize whether I'm alive or whether I'm dead? This ain't the end of the line. He's coming back for me. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have been put on mortality, then shall be swallowed up. Then shall be the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. If you're standing in this congregation today and you have lost someone you love by way of the grave, you and I both know That the hope you have in your bosom is I will see them again on the other side. 
John wrote a gospel that said, I'm writing it to the church. And the message he left behind that I think is the most critical is Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. I want you to take somebody by the hand. And I want you to just walk up here to the front of this uh, uh, auditorium today. And this is going to be all ad lib. You just stay right there. All them singers from Sister Hollins, if you're still here and haven't left, come up here and help me. Give me a drummer. Give me a bass player, whoever. We're going to sing an old song. We're going to sing an old song about getting out of here. Hallelujah. Because it's our hope today. Can't mean in 2009 you've got to hold on to the hope that Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. As the lightning shineth out of the east, even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming. 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 Some singers to help. Is there anybody here that can?